Um, remember that as Christians, there's uh, only one way to live. Actually, there's only one way to live, period. It's to live by faith, and uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And uh, so we want to be living the Christian way of life. Of course, sometimes we don't live by faith. We live by sight. And so as a result, there's two types of fruit that is produced. The fruit of the Spirit, which is produced through us by the Spirit of God, which is re rewardable and eternal in value. And there's the fruit of the flesh. And that's not rewardable, of course. And when we live by the flesh, of course, all sorts of sin comes forth. And these things need to be confessed. This is a confession that's private between the individual believer and the Lord. And 1 John 1, 9 speaks of it, right? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we like to just take an opportunity before we get started in the word and deal with this great doctrine of faith. And uh, each individual believer can privately confess if necessary. And, and if not, we just prepare ourselves for the word. Uh, for the teaching of the word, I pray that the Holy Spirit would teach us, okay? So let's take a moment and uh, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each individual person that's here. Each individual person born into this world, crafted in the image of God. Yes, fallen and sinners, but by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, uh, faith in him, we have everlasting life. And uh, we thank you you've called us out of the world to still live in the world and not become of the world, but to be a light to the world. And to uh, be transformed, as Paul says, by the renewing of our mind. That daily continual renewal that needs to take place. So we're learning to think your thoughts after you. And live lives that are increasingly pleasing to you. Uh, each of us have come here today. We have various um, struggles that we're facing. Uh, whether they're in our own personal life or those who are our loved ones. And de things that we're dealing with. Issues that we're facing. And we ask, Lord, that you would reinforce us today, strengthen us, so that we can get our focus back on you, off of the problems, so we can live by faith in your promises and overcome those, those issues. Help us to also be strengthened so we can encourage others around us. Uh, the whole world around us, even many Christians, um, are living mostly by fear rather than by faith. Certainly the world outside the church is in a state of fear and confusion, and uh, we pray, Lord, then that our lives will be stable reference points as they ref they go back to the scriptures and build upon the rock, build upon the truth, and um, that we may be able to uh, respectfully and gently uh, engage with people and direct them toward the truth, which is your word, which is found in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us today to be strengthened and to understand this great doctrine of faith, what it's all about. And uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but when I was younger, I was a soccer player. I still try to be a soccer player today if a ball happens to come in my vicinity. But uh, um, when I grew up, I grew up in a small town, and I, was, I excelled in soccer. It was something I loved, and I practiced by myself every single day. Uh, outside in my yard, playing on the neighbor's brick wall, juggling, dribbling, uh, learning new skills and so forth. And I, I loved the game, and I was usually <laughs> at the top in, as far as our uh, age group as we competed in our small community. Uh, but one thing I noticed as I tried to develop more and more skills and eventually did go on to college and, and play and so forth and scholarships and stuff, but one thing I noticed throughout all that was that every summer we had a, a camp, and I would go to soccer camp. It's something I always looked forward to. And what, what was interesting about camp was that they weren't teaching us more complicated uh, feints, you know, moves to outwit your opponent, but they always took us back to basics, you know, how, trap, how to trap the ball, how to pass the ball, how to shoot the ball, um, 
how to be aware of your surroundings and, and all of this on a field. And it was at that time when I was going back to basics that my, my game elevated. It wasn't because I was learning more complicated things. It was because I went back to basics. And that's what we're doing in the framework study. We go back to basics because to live the Christian life and really go to the next level, you have to have those basics down firm. And so the framework, at least the way I envision it, is really taking us back to basics. We go to creation. I mean, that's as basic as it can get, right? We learn about who God is, who man is, what nature is. We go to the fall. We learn about sin and suffering. I mean, what is wrong with this world? What's wrong with me, right? And then we go to judgment salvation at the flood. We realize that there's a God who is concerned about the world. He judges those who remain in rebellion against him, but he saves those who are oriented to him by faith. And so there's a solution in the end to the world's problems of sin and suffering. And then finally, of course, we're, we're now talking about Abraham. And what this event is all about is God called him out in Genesis 12 and the doctrine of faith, how Abraham believed God, the doctrine of justification, how God credited him with righteousness, the whole great doctrine that was really restored to the church at the time of the Reformation with Martin Luther and, and so forth, that whole story. Uh, and then, of course, the doctrine of election, what that is really all about, which we'll talk about uh, in a few weeks. So we're going back to basics, and this fifth event of Scripture, the call of Abraham, is, is a basic and fundamental event of Scripture which gives us really basic doctrines that Christians need to know. What's faith? What's justification? What is election? What is all this about? People have different ideas about this. What is going on? So what we said as far as history is concerned in Genesis 12, what's taking place is the end of an era. Okay? The era from the time of the flood to the Tower of Babel is a time when you had these folks like Melchizedek, who was a Gentile king priest. And they were the ones who were the, taking the revelation of God uh, to the world. But that was obviously unsuccessful. And we see that at the Tower of Babel, right, as the men of the world gather to rebel against God. And immediately following that, we discover more about this Melchizedek figure and how he meets with Abraham, and he sort of passes the torch, so to speak. Uh, he blesses Abraham. He blesses Abram's God. And Abraham pays tithes to, him, to, to Melchizedek, uh, recognizing his priesthood that God had set up for that era. But now is the change in God's strategy. God's strategy is no longer going to be to work with every you know, person, every people group, but he's going to work with one nation. And through that one nation, Israel, he wants to take that nation. He's going to separate them from all the other nations, right? He's going to peel them off, so to speak. And then what he's going to do is he's going to teach that nation so they can mature in the Word of God so that as mature believers, the nation Israel can go back to the Gentile world, to the rest of the nations, and bring the truth to them. That was the whole basic strategy with the nation Israel. Okay? So that's the event we're studying, how God started all that with one man named Abram. Okay, so we looked at the historical event like we always do, and we really kind of went through it. And we said the first thing that happened as far as order of events in Abraham's life is God appeared to Abram in a powerful speaking event. That's based on the original languages in Genesis 7-2. The concept that there was this appearance of God where he spoke to Abraham. We call, I call that a powerful speaking event. Abram knew who was speaking to him that it was his creator. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing is that Abram believed God's promises. I mean, first you have to hear, point one, and then secondly, you believe, because faith comes by hearing. And so the first two illustrate Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God spoke, Abraham believed. The third thing that happened in the sequence was God credited Abram's faith as righteousness. He counted him righteous. We'll talk about that doctrine next week, what that means for God to count or credit or impute righteousness to an individual. Okay. Now, we said this all happened while he was still in Ur, which, is, which was his homeland. It's where he grew up. It was very close to Babel, where the Tower of Babel was. It's all there in the Mesopotamian River Valley. Okay. So 
That's where these things happen. Now, the fourth thing that happened is Abraham went forth from Ur to the land that God would show him. Okay? Genesis 12, 4, Hebrews eleven eight, 8, Acts 7, 4, all discuss he went forth uh, to a place that God would show him. He didn't know where he was going. He was just trusting the Lord. And the fifth thing that happened was when Abram was in the land, God chose him to be the recipient of the covenant, right? And so we find the second reference in the whole of history to a covenant, okay? The first covenant, and if that's too religious a word, we just say it's a contract, something like a contract that God, in this case, enters with man. Because we're all familiar with contracts if you've ever bought a car or a house or anything uh, that requires some kind of mortgage or payment. Okay? So God enters into a contract for the second time. Okay? The first time he entered it with Noah and all flesh. The sign is the rainbow in the sky, right? And the terms are God will never flood the earth again. Okay? That's a great promise of God. It gives us stability in this world. Uh, the second great covenant is described in Genesis 15. And here the parties are God, Abram, and eventually his ethnic descendants through Isaac and Jacob, okay? So Isaac and not Ishmael, right? And uh, Jacob and not Esau, right? So God has a specific parties to this covenant that come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down through the 12 tribes. Okay, those are the parties to the covenant. The founding sacrifice, remember Genesis 15, they cut the animals in half. They laid half over here and half over there. It was a bloody, uh, solemn uh, ceremony, covenant ceremony. And God, in the form of a smoking oven and flaming torch, passed through the pieces. Okay, he passed through and he alone passed through as Abraham was conked out on a rock. Okay? So that puts the onus on God to do what he said he would do. And that's the third part. What, what, did, what did he say? These are called the legal terms. I mean, these are legal documents. They're court documents. That's why it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're court witnesses or testimonies. Um, okay? So the three basic terms that God promised as he passed through the pieces to give Abraham was a land, a seed, or an offspring, and blessing, global blessing that would go to the whole world. This is the whole idea that God is going to take the nation Israel, set them apart from the nations, right? Mature them in the word of God so they, think they can go back to the world and reach the world with the truth. By the way, that's the same paradigm for us as Christians, right? You become a Christian and you're just a baby. Are you ready to be teachers of the word? No. <laughs> you're just trying to learn. You know, you're, getting, you're in your spiritual diapers, Okay. Uh, and you make a mess all over yourself, okay? But you get cleaned up, and you learn how to walk, and you grow, and you develop, right? It's the whole thing, right? That's what you do. You, you become a believer, then you grow and mature, so you can do what? So the, then you can go and disciple others, okay? That's the whole plan of God. So the nation Israel is doing a similar type thing in the Old Testament, okay? The fourth thing about this covenant is the sign. God always gives a sign. I mean, when you sign a contract, you've got to... You, you got to sign here and here and here and here and here, and it goes on for 25 minutes. Okay, and you're signing your life away is what you're doing. Uh, but in this case, uh, God gave a sign to Abraham of the Abrahamic covenant, and it was physical circumcision in the flesh, in the flesh, you know. It was very visible. And it pointed to the need for every Jew to have spiritual circumcision of the heart, right? Just like Abraham. When Abraham believed, he was justified. He was also given a new heart. His heart was regenerated. Uh, I read lately a lot of people say, well, Old Testament people weren't regenerated. You know, that's a work of the Holy Spirit that wasn't happening in the Old Testament. Well, no, it was, it was happening in the Old Testament. There's other ministries of the Holy Spirit that weren't happening in the Old Testament, like baptism of the Spirit, uh, indwelling of the Spirit in every believer. That's not present in the Old Testament. But there are still ministries of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, he filled certain people for various activities, such as building the temple and so forth. Uh, he also did regenerate people or give them a circumcised heart when they believed. Okay, so the Jews were to be physically circumcised and that was to point to the need for that little boy um, to later believe, of course, and become spiritually circumcised. So these things are all present in the Abrahamic covenant. What we're going to do today is go into the three, first of three doctrines that come out of the call of Abraham. Okay? And these three doctrines are, as I mentioned, Faith, justification, and election, okay? Essentially, what happened is, is very simple to see from the Bible, okay? God spoke, 
Abraham believed, God credited him or justified him, and God chose him then to be the recipient of the covenant blessings. Okay? But of course, to enjoy those blessings as a Jew, you had to ultimately be spiritually circumcised. You had to have a faith like, like Abraham, right? So let's start today with the, with the doctrine of faith, okay? And the only way to do this is to start with definition. If we don't define our terms, when we speak with people, we end up going on for 30 minutes and not understanding that the other person means something different than what we're saying, even though we're using the same, same words, right? So we define terms. As I do this, I'll also use the word belief or, and sometimes believe. Okay, those are synonyms for faith. Okay, they don't mean something different. They're the same uh, term. So I'll just use them interchangeably. Uh, first of all, what, is, what faith is not? <laughs> uh, first of all, faith is not uncertainty. Okay? Faith is not just a guess. Now, we can use it that way. You may say to your teacher, well, I believe the answer is, and you're not really sure. Okay. But that's not how the Bible is using the word faith. Okay? It's not using it as a guess or a hope so. Okay? Um, it's much more certain. The second thing that faith is not is faith is not a leap into the unknown. This is the concept of a leap of faith. Okay? Um, what a leap of faith into the unknown is, is the concept that if we have this faith that is um, based on nothing, really, and therefore it's just a leap, okay, that somehow this is, makes something true for you. Okay? It's something true for you. It's considered by some to be a higher kind of, of faith. Okay? Well, that kind of faith uh, concept does not come from the Bible either. Okay? Where it came from was an existential philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard in the 1840s. That's where the whole concept of leap of faith came from. It didn't come from Paul. It didn't come from Jesus. It didn't come from Moses. It didn't come from David. It came from Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, and what happened is his philosophy, existential philosophy, crept into the church through another church theologian named Karl Barth in the 1840s, right after World War II. And this developed... Uh, into what is today known as the New Orthodoxy or New Evangelicalism. And the idea of this type of faith is that you can't have true knowledge of God from the Bible. You can't. Okay? The Bible is not the Word of God. Okay? It is only a testimony to the Word of God. That's a little tricky in the language. But this, they would say, is not the Word of God. It's only a testimony that, to the Word of God. And the only way to have true knowledge, they say, is by experiencing God. Okay. And this, you know, maybe Henry T. Blackaby experiencing God, you know. All this discussion about experience over the last 70 to 80 years is, is coming out of this. You need to have this personal experience with God. Because, see, this isn't really the Word of God, okay, in their thinking, okay? The only way to really have contact with God is not through his word, but through an experience with him, okay? So they discuss this as a leap of faith into the unknown. That's how you experience God, okay? So that, again, that is not uh, the idea of biblical faith, okay? The idea of biblical faith is that in the Bible, in the word of God itself, there is knowledge of God, and that it is true, okay? And we put our faith in the content of the Scripture, what God has spoken, okay? So, briefly then, faith is not two things, okay? It's not uncertainty. It's not just a guess or something vague, okay? And second, it's not a leap into the unknown, okay? Well, what is faith then? The word <laughs> means confidence, Reliance upon, trust in someone or something, because that someone or something is reliable, okay? It's firm, okay? Faith is confidence, it's reliance upon or trust in someone or something, because it or they are, are reliable, 
or firm. Okay, if I trust you, it's because you have demonstrated to me that you are reliable. You are firm. I can put this in your hands and I can walk away and trust it will be done because you have shown me you are a reliable person. That's why we trust people. The people we don't trust are people who have demonstrated to us that they are not reliable. If I give it to them and I say, do this, accomplish this for me, this task, then I have to go back five minutes later and ten minutes later to make sure it has been done. Because I'm not sure you are reliable. You have not shown me reliability, right? So when I trust you, what I'm saying is the object, you, are reliable, you are firm, and so I express my faith or confidence in you as a person, okay? We do the same things with objects, right? We trust that certain objects are reliable because they have shown us over and over they are reliable. I get in my car, I turn the starter, it goes, it, the engine fires up, okay? And all of a sudden, one day it's not, <laughs> and it doesn't, okay? But Generally speaking, what? We have faith that when we turn the key, the car is going to start because the car has over and over shown me it is reliable. It is firm, okay? It's something I can trust, okay? So this is the concept of faith. Now, we become convinced or persuaded that some proposition or object is reliable and when we transfer our confidence to that proposition or that object, what are we doing? We are expressing faith. Do you see that it's not a leap? Okay? A leap is you go to someone, you have no idea about their integrity, and you totally just entrust something to them. That's not an easy thing to do, and it's probably not a smart thing to do, is it? Because you're probably going to end up disappointed. So... Let's develop, now that we've defined faith, let's develop five points to the doctrine of faith. Okay? The first point is that faith rests upon God doing the initiating. It rests upon God doing the initiating. This is to say that God is the one who makes the first move toward man. He initiates with us. Okay? There are several verses and several illustrations. I've listed some of the illustrations here. In some of the verses, okay? When Adam fell, let's just go back to Genesis, we've been there. When Adam fell, who initiated the conversation? God or Adam? God. What was Adam doing? Hiding, okay? He wasn't looking for God, he's hiding from God. So do you see that God initiated the conversation? If Adam was going to have faith in God at that point, after he fell... It would depend upon God taking the initiative, which he did. Now this makes sense because there are verses that support this type of thing, like Romans 10, 17. How does faith come? By hearing. So what has to happen before you can have faith? The hearing. The hearing of what? The hearing of the word of God, which is what the verse states. Okay? Another illustration, in Acts 16, Paul was in Thyatira. And there was a woman there. Her name was Lydia. You probably remember. She's a, a sewer of purple fabrics, okay? It says while Paul was speaking there, it says she, quote, was listening, you know, hearing. And it says the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken, okay? So what does that illustrate? It illustrates, again, that first there was the listening or hearing of the word. And as that was being heard... The Lord opened her heart. He was at work in her life, and she responded with faith. Okay? So there has to be this initiatory work of God, okay? and that often takes place through us uh, preaching the word, telling someone uh, the gospel. Okay? And what does the, the scriptures say? This? They say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings of great joy. Right? How beautiful are the feet? You know, it's, a, it's a picture of the one who brings the word of God to others, right? As we do that, we bring the word of God, God to others. They hear and God is at work, okay? There's the work of the convicting ministry of the Spirit. This takes place, you know, before a person believes. He's at work in an unbeliever to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, okay? 
So this is all ways that God does the initiating so that a person can be prompted to have faith. Okay? Now, when what we don't mean, so we're clear on this, is that we don't mean that God gives a person faith and that person then gives it, that faith back to God. Okay, that's, that's going too far. Um, that's one of the aspects of the five points of Calvinism, which has this concept that when a person is spiritually dead, and we're all born spiritually dead, right? But we're, we can't respond to God. We're unable to respond to God. So what God has to do is he has to give the person faith, okay? And he does this in the work, they say, of regeneration. He will regenerate a person. And in the regeneration, give them faith. And then the regenerate individual then gives faith back to God. So the whole idea here is, again, you're so spiritually dead, you can't respond to God with faith, so God has to regenerate you first, okay? And then in the regeneration, he gives you faith, and then you give that faith back to, to God, okay? That's going further than what, what we're saying, because it's saying that there's no human requirement on regeneration or salvation, no human requirement, that God basically saves a person, and gives them faith, and then they, they give that faith back to God. Um, they quote Ephesians 2, 8 all the time. So we'll mention this, this passage. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Well, you probably know the verse. Uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The question is, well, what, what is the gift of, of God? Uh, the grammar doesn't really flesh out that the gift is faith, okay? Because faith is feminine in the Greek language, and the gift is neuter, okay? And last time I checked, females are not neuter. Uh, neither are males, okay? So there's not agreement in the Greek text what is most likely is that the, the whole phrase or concept of the preceding clause, which is salvation, okay, is, gift, is the gift. For by grace you have been saved. Salvation is, is the gift. Okay? That's the gift of God. Okay? But in order for a man to be saved, uh, he does have to have, have faith. Okay? And to have faith, God has to do the initiating. He has to start. And I've mentioned... Uh, several ways or channels through which he does this. Uh, one is the preaching of the word, so it can be heard, right? Uh, the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, that's an unseen work that we don't have access to. The Holy Spirit does this as the word is being preached to an unbeliever. He convicts them. Uh, if we went to John 6, we could talk about the drawing ministry. There's a drawing ministry that takes place, which is probably closely connected to this convicting work of the Spirit. Uh, but in the end, after these works of God, the person does have to believe. Like it says over and over, it will say, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness, or whatever. Or the Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said, you have to believe. You know, believe. <laughs> okay, that's not something God is going to do for you. Okay, he will do the convicting work, he will do the drawing work, okay, but he's not going to believe for you, okay? So faith rests upon God doing the initiation, okay? And if God doesn't speak through us or through his word as someone reads it in a hotel or whatever, okay, then people can't, can't come to faith, okay? The second thing about faith is that faith is not a work, Okay? What we mean here is that it's not something meritorious that God looks at and uh, justifies us because he sees some work that we had done called faith, okay? Uh, no, faith does not contribute to our salvation, okay? It doesn't save us, okay? Uh, it's what God saves us through. It's a, it's a channel or an instrument through which God saves us, okay? Okay. Um, now, there are many Christians who say that if we have to have the faith, as I've said we do, then all of a sudden now we are contributing to our salvation. Okay? That could only be true if faith is a work. Then we would be contributing to our salvation. But the, the scriptures teach, 
and uh, illustrate that faith is not a work. It's not something that has any merit to it. So let's look at Romans 4, verses 2 through 5. Paul's illustrating, using Abram to illustrate the doctrine of faith. That's why we're bringing up the doctrine of faith, because when you see Abraham mentioned in the New Testament, you see that Paul wants to teach about faith. He wants to teach about justification, okay? These great truths that go back to Genesis 12 and 15. He's discussing how Abraham was justified, which we've already studied in Genesis 15. Okay, so verse 2 of Romans 4. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And then he quotes from uh, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Question then. So was Abraham doing a work by believing God? No. It says if he worked, he would have something uh, to boast about. But he didn't have anything to boast about because he didn't have to work. He had faith. Verse 4. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. I mean, how many of you ever had a job? Uh, at the end of the week or the end of two weeks or every month, you get a paycheck. Okay? That's not a favor. And you don't have to say, thank you for giving me a paycheck. Because you did the work, you earned it. Okay? You should get paid. It's what is due. Okay? But verse 5, he says, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And there it is. The contrast is super clear in verse 5. The one who does not work, but rather believes. Right? So, see, belief is not a work. Okay? Belief is the opposite of work. It's not doing something to receive something. It's simply receiving something. It's just receiving something. Uh, John 1, 12, the Gospel of John. Many call the Gospel of, of belief because it mentions belief over and over and over and over and over. A hundred, hundred times, okay? John 1, 12. If I'm going to say that belief is receiving something, I have to prove that. So John 1, 12 But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. See, receiving him is a synonym for believing in his name. Okay? And when you receive something, see, you're not doing anything for it. You're just, you're just accepting it. Okay? So, believe, uh, receive, accept. Christ, these, these are all synonyms. They're, they're fine. They're legitimate. Now, I've said faith is not a work. Turn to John 6, 29. We're in the Gospel of John. Some people say, well, this is teaching that faith is a work. So let's just uh, look at one of the counterexamples. People say, no, 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 it's a work. We've already said in Romans 4 that he who does not work but believes, so it can't be this work, but nevertheless, some people keep pushing this point. This is the verse, John 6, 29, where Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You say, well, gee, it sounds like the work of God is to believe, okay, or that God gave him faith or something like that. That's, that's not at all what Jesus is saying in this, in this context, and it, it's quite clear. So let's just read a little bit more. What did they want him to do in verse 28? They said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? They want to do miracles. Those are the works of God. Then he said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom, whom he has sent. In other words, you're not going to do miracles, okay, but believe in the one who is doing the miracles. That's the whole point. Verse 30. So they said to them, well, 
What then do, do you do for the, uh, a sign? Do a sign so that we may see and believe. See, they want him to do the work of God so they can believe in him. They ask him, well, what work do you perform? And uh, he goes on to discuss the work of God. But the whole point then is that Jesus was the one who was doing the works of God. And there we're supposed to have the proper response to that, which is to believe in him. Okay, it's not saying faith is a work. It's saying that the work of God is what people need to respond to. Okay, believe. Okay, so the second point is faith is not a work. First point, God has to initiate, right? If there's going to be faith. Third point is that faith requires content. There has to be some content to believe. And it has to be content that you can think about. It can't just be gobbledygook. Okay? It has to be something you can think about. And you have to understand it in order to believe it. Okay? Think of uh, the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples up in a very pagan place called Caesarea Philippi in the northern portion of Israel. Where he came to them and he said, who do the people say that I am? Remember that? And Peter and you know, they pipe up and some say, well, uh, some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Still others say you're Jeremiah or, or one of the prophets. Okay? That's what the people believed. Okay? That's what they were thinking about when they looked at Jesus. Okay? But Jesus then asked his disciples, okay, but who do you, who do you guys say that I am? He's asking, what do you think about my person? Okay? See, faith has to have content. It has to involve thinking. Who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? That's the whole point. Okay? And Peter said, we all know, the famous confession, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. That is what Peter thought, right? It's what he believed, but it's also what he thought. This, this, these go together. It's a message that has content, okay? Now, how do you get people to understand a message that has content, okay? You have to know the terms, okay? If I stand up here in front of you and I start talking about transfer cases and uh, limited slip differentials, you probably, most of you, do not know what I'm talking about, even though what I just said has content and it has meaning, Okay? But the reason that you can't believe it, <laughs> what I'm talking about, is you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? Now, you have to understand the terms of the gospel to be able to believe it. Okay? Think of, it, think of children. Okay? Do children have to understand the gospel before they can believe the gospel? Well, of course. Okay? They have to know certain things. They have to know, well, what is sin? Okay? Uh, who is God? What, what is death? Okay. Uh, if they're going to believe in Jesus okay, and what Jesus did for them and what the cross and the death and sin and, and all that is for and about, what it means, then they have to understand those things. Okay. Uh, you can tell the gospel to a six-month-old till you're blue in the face, but can they ever believe at six months of age? They just can't. Why not? Well, because they don't understand the words. Okay? So this gets really practical because as parents, as grandparents, right? we have children, we have grandchildren. Okay? What can we do as parents to prepare our children to believe the gospel? We can speak about these words. We can speak about who God is. We can speak about what sin is. We can speak about what death is. We can speak about who Jesus is. We can speak about what the cross is. We can talk about what salvation is. Okay? As we talk about those things, what are we doing? We're forming categories in the child's mind so that they can understand the gospel, so that it can click at some point. Okay? Now, what if you have a parent who's not speaking about these categories? They don't speak about these things at all. Okay? Well, they're, they're speaking about things, but they're therefore forming other categories for their child's mind. Okay? And if all these other categories are formed, and then you and I come along and start, well, don't you believe in Jesus? He died on the cross for your sins and rose again. Does that have any meaning for them if they don't have 
the terms for what we're talking about. No, they're not going to know what you're... kids will say. Who's she? You know, and stuff like that. They, it doesn't mean anything because these categories of thought have to be formed in a person's mind. Okay, so they can be understood, so they can believe. Because faith requires content. Okay, and that's why it has become so hard to speak the gospel into our culture. Okay, with understanding. It's because what happened in our culture is the Bible has been removed from society. So the categories of thinking have shifted in our society. The categories are not who is God, what is sin, what is holiness, what is the cross of Jesus Christ about, who is he. Those categories have all been lost. Okay? So to regain those, we have to, of course, speak these things. Okay? So... Faith is a response, but it's a faith is a response to a message that has content. Okay, and that content has to be understood. Okay. Now, what is what is the content? What, in other words, what is the gospel? What does a person have to believe in order to be saved? It might bother you that I'm going to say what I'm about to say, but the content a person has to believe through history has actually changed. Okay. Did Adam believe that Jesus died on the cross for him and rose again? Is that what Adam believed? Is that what Noah believed? No. What did Adam believe? He believed that promise that God made of the seed of the woman would come, and he understood something about sacrifice because God slaughtered a lamb and covered him in the skins. He knew something about sacrifice, and he knew something about a seed, and he believed God and this promise. Okay. So the actual content, of course, got sharper and more focused until you reach the time of Christ. And there, of course, now the content is solidified. Okay, it's 1 it's Corinthians 15. So let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 15. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Paul is making known to the brethren here, verse 1, the gospel. The gospel he had preached to them, which they had also received. Okay, and so forth. And what is it? It's verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And here it is. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, meaning it's the subject of Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would die. And that he was buried. Okay. In other words, how do I? That's the evidence. That's the historical evidence. How do I know that he died? Well, because he was put in a tomb. <laughs> That's how. Okay. And then that he was raised on the third day. That one's also according to the scripture. So the resurrection is also a subject of Old Testament prophecy. Psalm 16, he would not undergo decay. Okay. Also in the Jonah account, three days and three nights and so forth. And then in the resurrection, he's, there's Jonah's back. Okay. So this is a subject of Old Testament prophecy. And that he appeared. Okay. That's the evidence again. That's the evidence of the resurrection. How do I know he was resurrected? Well, because he appeared. And it goes through a great long list of witnesses. So the gospel centers on the two key components of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. The burial and the appearance, those are evidences. They're not the essential core of the gospel. Somebody doesn't have to believe in the appearance of Christ to be saved. But they do have to believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay? Because on the, on the cross, that's where he died for our sins. The resurrection is the evidence that, in fact, the payment was received. By the Father. So that's the content that a person has to believe in order to be saved. So does a person have to understand these basic concepts uh, in order to be saved? Yes. Okay. And can an unbeliever, through the work of God the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the Word, come to understand these things and then believe them? Well, you're here and I'm here. So... This is why, for example, we're so concerned about translating the Bible accurately into other languages for people groups and tribes and nations. Because those people cannot be saved apart from knowing what it is, the content that they need to believe okay, about Christ. Um, if people could be saved apart from the gospel, why are we spending millions of dollars to support missionaries and send them out all over the world? That'd be a silly thing to do. We ought to spend our resources more wisely, right? But the fact is, people have to have content in order to believe and be saved. So we are very concerned about missionaries and translating the Bible accurately. 
and getting the word to people around the world. That's the third point. Faith requires content. Okay? The fourth thing is faith's object is what saves. I mentioned this before, but faith doesn't save anyone. Okay? If faith saves you, what, what happens if you lose your faith? Well, then you lose your salvation. <laughs> the Bible never teaches that faith saves you. It teaches you that the object of your faith is what saves you. And that object is God, Christ, or the promises of God or Christ, okay? which are equivalents in Scripture. Okay? So it's the object that becomes all important. Okay? I mention this because of the Protestant Catholic debate over this over the centuries. Uh, the first Protestant reformers, Luther, and then a little bit later, Calvin comes on the scene, they insisted that justification is by faith alone, and when you trust in God, okay, you have full acceptance with God. He fully accepts you. Okay? Now, that, that was a radical idea in Northern Europe at the time of the Reformation in the 1500s because, you know, like Martin Luther, he's a good monk, right? In the Roman Catholic Church, he was basically taught that God is righteous and you're a sinner and you're under, the wrathful, you're under a wrathful God. Okay? All he's doing is expecting judgment. That's, that's Luther's point of view as a monk. Okay? But he understands as he reads the book of Romans, actually, that God was satisfied with Christ. And so God was satisfied with those who believe in Christ. And this, he says... Uh, like a, he was like a caged bird and it, it, it was like the, the cage opened and he was free when he discovered this truth in, in the book of Romans. Okay? Here's what Calvin uh, said, just so you can see it, because later Calvin rejected this. Okay? He's got his Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's now two volumes. Um, he wrote that throughout his life. It had many, many revisions. It started off very small when he was 26 years of age. Uh, probably only been a believer for just a few years, uh, about three or four years, he wrote his first book, Christian Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's very thin. By the end of his life, it's, it's two volumes, okay? But here's what he said in his early life, okay? And this is right. Later, he's going to leave this, okay? He said, faith is a firm and sure knowledge of divine favor toward us. You know, you can know that God is pleased with you. That's what he's saying. It's founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ and is revealed to our minds and sealed in our hearts by the Holy, Holy Spirit. So he, he, this was a breath of fresh air for people in the 16th century, okay? They were living under this whole concept that I've got to appease a wrathful God. And now suddenly people are saying, I can know that I have full acceptance with God. I can know that he's satisfied with me. Now, the next quote I'm going to give you didn't come from Calvin. It came from a scholar of Calvinist, uh, Calvin's thought. And so he's summarizing and, again, giving an accurate portrayal of what he early on believed. When we so examine ourselves, you know, we look in, he says, however, it is not to see whether our holiness, our works, or the fruit of the Spirit in our lives warrant assurance of salvation. What he's saying is you don't look in and say, uh, how am I doing? And on the basis of how I think I'm doing measure whether I'm really saved or not, okay? He says, rather, it's to determine that such assurance rests on the proper foundation of God's mercy in Christ. Where does my assurance rest? Does my assurance rest on me looking in, or does it rest on when I look out at Christ, see? It's a totally different perspective, okay? See, the issue is not about my faith and my works. The issue is the object of my faith, who is Christ, see? We have to stop asking whether we had the right kind of faith or not and simply ask, have I understood that I am a sinner in the eyes of my Creator who is holy and I've offended Him, but Christ died and His righteousness satisfied God? See? If I, if I believe that, I'm saved, <laughs> okay? I have confidence. I have assurance, okay? My assurance is not in me. My assurance is in Christ Himself, so it's not an assurance based on my works or lack of works. It's an assurance based on Christ and his work. Now, this is early on in the Reformation, and they, they were nailing it, okay? They were nailing the gospel, okay? Later on, Calvin was challenged because the Roman Catholic Church began a group 
of high-powered intellectual uh, monks called the Jesuits. Okay? And the Jesuits were created to counter the Reformation guys, okay? to counter their arguments. Their argument was this. If you reformers say that people can have assurance of salvation, that they know they can know they're saved, then those people are going to go off and live, you know, sinful lives. I mean, they're going to use that as a license to sin. Okay? Now, Calvin did feel the strength of this argument, and so he changed his tune. And now I'm going to show you what he wrote in his last uh, edition of his Institutes for the Christian Religion. Okay? He said, it's faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. You may have to like mull that around a little bit, you know, because we want to say, yeah, 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 faith alone that saves is faith. Actually, it's really God that saves, but okay. Uh, but the faith that saves is never alone. In other words, there's, there's different kinds of faith. Do you see that in the last statement? There's certain kinds of faith, okay, there's faith that has something attached to it, and that's the kind that saves, okay, and there's faith that doesn't have anything attached to it, okay, and it, it doesn't save, okay. So this is the whole concept that there are different kinds of faith, okay, and you've got to have the right one in order to be saved, and the right one is the one that has works attached to it, okay? It's a faith, we might say, that works, okay? So the issue became, after the Jesuits, and he wrote this in 1563, just before he died, do I have the right kind of faith? Okay, and this is what the Puritans are, are all about. Okay, as much as you may love to read the Puritans, and I actually like to read some of it, but most of it's an internal introspection. It's looking in myself to try to find assurance. Are my prayers good enough? Are my works good enough? Do I have the right stuff to illustrate that I really am saved? Maybe you even saw the movie, The Right Stuff. Did you see that movie? It's decades old now. Um, the guy who wrote the, the script for that his background was in Reformed theology, and this is what, that's, what it, that's what it's about. It's a theological statement uh, that he put you know, for the astronauts. Do you have the right stuff to be an astronaut and go to the moon and be the first people on the moon and all that? Do you have the right stuff, you know? Um, <laughs> so the question for the Puritans was, do I have the right stuff? I look at my life. Does my life actually show that I'm really a believer? Okay. So there's this constant looking at your life to try to find assurance. Is that the way we do it? Or do we look outward to Christ okay, and find our assurance in him? See. So if we look in and we try to find assurance here, are we ever going to really find total assurance? No, we're not. Okay? It destroys assurance. <laughs> the later Protestants okay, and the Roman Catholics, of course, ended up deciding that you could not have 100% assurance of your salvation. Okay? And that's why the Calvinists developed the whole concept that what you have to do then is you have to persevere in the faith until the end of your life. You have to keep on believing. It wasn't faith in Christ at a moment in time. It was faith in Christ continually till the end of your life. And if you stop persevering, then you were never really saved to begin with. That was the whole idea. Okay? You've got to have the right kind of faith, the kind that perseveres to the end, the kind that keeps producing works, okay, and so forth. So people then and people now do a lot of sitting around wondering whether they have the right kind of faith or not. Okay? So you can see a shift in the Reformation, what happened early on. It was, it was very, you can have firm assurance. It's based on Christ versus later it's based no inside me on my works. Okay? In a way, the Jesuits you know, won the argument. Okay? So what it, now... Everybody was worried, apparently, that if we tell people that they're saved, if I tell you, if I give you assurance that, hey, Jesus says that if you believe in him, you have everlasting life, nothing can ever take that away. You, you can have total assurance of your salvation, right? People were worried that you might not live the right kind of life after that. You might use that or abuse that and go live a sinful life, see, and say, well, I'm saved. It doesn't matter what I do, okay, right? Now, is that, is that really what will happen? It could happen, I guess, if somebody doesn't really understand the doctrines of grace. But let's discuss what is the motive to live the Christian life. Why do I want to live the Christian life? Well, the grace of God toward me. That's why. The grace of God toward you and toward me who are sinners. See? So what we do then 
is we look at what God has done for us first, and now out of gratitude and appreciation, okay, I want to live the Christian way of life. If it's not gratitude, if I'm not trying to live the Christian life because of gratitude, then I'm still trying to secure my own salvation. See, I'm still trying to be good enough in my Christian life to prove I really am saved. Okay? Unfortunately, then, the original doctrine of faith that the Protestants developed, which is a true one, was preserved only in very small pockets of the church, and today it's only held in certain uh, free grace groups. Okay? Now, it gets attacked, and here's how it's attacked. Well, you hold to cheap grace or easy believism. Have you heard those? Yeah. What's this easy believism stuff? What's well, the idea that you can uh, believe, just believe and then go out and, you know, sin and still be considered a real believer? Well, yeah, that's the gospel. That is the gospel. That's what it teaches. We are sinners and we are saved by grace, okay? It doesn't mean we should go out and we should sin and raise hell. It doesn't mean that, okay? Of course we shouldn't do that. But the measuring stick for whether we are real believers or not is not our performance. It's not. It's whether we put our faith in the right object, Jesus Christ and his performance on the cross. And that's the only thing that counts. The point then here, the fourth point, is that it's not our faith that saves us. It's the object of our faith. Did we put our faith in Christ? And we don't come along behind that and say, now, am I really a believer? Did I have the right kind of faith? That's not the issue. Okay? The issue is the object of my faith. Did I put my faith in the proper object? Lastly, the fifth thing, the gospel must be believed. I mean, if a person is to be saved... Okay? They have to personally believe the gospel. It's not enough just to understand the gospel. Okay? I understand evolution because I was trained and taught it in the university. And I got a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. And I worked in plant physiology for five years. I understand, not every jot and tittle of evolution, but I understand the theory of evolution. But I don't believe it. Okay? Someone can also understand the gospel but not believe it, okay? In other words, not be persuaded that it's true, okay? So there's a difference in understanding something and actually agreeing with it or believing it, okay? Involved in this, of course, is something that happens in the mind, and this is the thought process, okay? If I do not believe something one day, but then I come to believe something tomorrow, there's been a change in my thinking about the subject, that is what we call repentance. A change in mind of our thinking about a subject is repentance. Okay? I could change my mind tomorrow and think that Chevys are sorry and Ford is good. Okay? I'm not going to change my mind. But, <laughs> but anyway, I stir up too much controversy over things that are of great importance. Okay? Okay? But if I did change my mind, that would be repentance. Okay? When a person in their mind has changed their thinking about the gospel and they agree with it, they've repented, okay? It happens coterminously with faith. It happens together with faith, okay? So when I'm saying, yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, yes, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, at some point I had a change of mind in there, okay? And that's when I'm having faith. I'm putting my confidence in him, okay? Now, the problem with repentance is that word, right? <laughs> that people define it as turning from sin. That's the problem, okay? Because they get that from the Latin, and the word repentance comes from a Latin word, from penance, do penance, okay? This whole concept that I've got to turn from something and do something here, okay, to get some kind of satisfaction with God. That's not the meaning of the word, okay? The Greek word metanoia, metanoia just means change of mind, change of my thinking. I don't think that you can go from not believing the gospel to believing the gospel without having a change in your thinking, that's just tied up with faith. They're not two separate things, okay? There's some, two things that are happening at the same time, okay? So I don't really tell someone, though, I mean, most of the time the Bible just says believe. There's a few passages that says repent, and I think is using it as a synonym, like Acts 11, 15, 16, and 17. Peter says they believed. The Jews said, well, then God has granted repentance to life even to Gentiles. I think they're being used there as two parts of the same thing, uh, 
they're not two separate things. Okay, Lewis Barry Chafer said it this way, if you have a coin, faith is one side of the coin, repentance is the other. Okay, the two are inseparable on a coin. You can't have heads without a tails, right? So repentance is involved in faith, okay? And that's what's happening, okay, when we believe, okay? We're having a change of thinking about the proposition that Christ died and he rose again. So in conclusion, okay, here's what we do. If we want to get straight in our mind faith, the doctrine of faith, here's what we have to, here's the best way to do it and the best way to teach people and teach kids. You do the same thing that Paul did, okay? All I'm telling you to do is the same thing Paul did in Romans 4. When he wanted to talk about how we were justified, he went immediately to Abraham. It's a perfect picture. We can illustrate it. We don't have to sit here and argue about this verse or that verse. We say, we'll just go to Abraham. (laughs) And we see what? We see God speak, right, to Abraham. Abraham believes God. God credits him as righteousness. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Abraham do any work? No. He just believed. Was there content for him to believe? Yes, God told him the terms. I will give you a land, seed, and blessing. There's the content. Okay, he believed what God, he believed God. Okay, he didn't do anything. Okay, he received a promise of God. Okay, and that's what we do when we believe the gospel. We are receiving the promise of God that he gives us eternal life. He gives us salvation when we believe in Christ who died for our sin and rose again. Now, that's all there is, <laughs> that's all there is to it. Um, we get a free gift of, of salvation um, if you've trusted in Christ who died for you, for your sin personally. And it was nailed to the cross. Okay? All of it, all of your sin, all of my sin, past, present, and future. Okay, once for all, he paid for it all. He said it's finished, right? And when you believe in him, see, at that moment, the very righteousness of Christ is credited to you. We'll talk about what that means next week. But think about what, what you have. If you haven't believed it, what, do you, what are you waiting on? What, what are you waiting on? Okay. It's a free gift. He offers it to you in full. Okay. And um, it's freeing, right? Just like Luther, you know, when he understood this, he says he's like a, a bird in a cage who was set free. You can be that bird in the cage or you can be a bird set free from a cage. Which, where do you want to be? See, You want to have the freedom to live as you were designed to live in Christ, in harmony with your creator? Then just believe in Christ, right? And at that moment, you have eternal life. Nothing can ever take that away from you. Nothing can ever take it away from me. You say, but I still sin. That's, again, that's not the issue. The issue is, did Christ pay for it? Yes, he did. Should we go on sinning? No, of course not. Of course not. But we're appreciative of what he's done for us. That's the motive to live now a new life. Okay, so next week we will move to the doctrine of justification. We'll talk about what this really meant and what happened at the Reformation and why it's so important and why there really is, really is a difference. Okay? okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you designed a salvation that we could have that's not based on any merit in ourselves, not any work, but a free gift given through faith when we put it in the proper object, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he's done it all. We thank you that there's not a sin in the world, whether it was done by Hitler or Stalin or anyone or Mao or anybody, that Jesus Christ didn't pay for on the cross. And to realize the immensity then of your grace, what you have done for us, and the free offer that's available to anyone and to everyone who's ever came into this world. And also, of course, you know, work with our children, work with our grandchildren to establish the category so they can understand who God is what sin is, who I am, why Christ came, so we can prepare them to hear the gospel and believe the gospel, how practical and wonderful it is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tato? It's it's going, isn't it? (laughs) Okay. Our last song today before we close will be number 10, How Great Thou Art, and we will sing all four verses.
When I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great. Thou art, and when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.